The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Coming up on the agenda. Teenage years can be rough. Doesn't mean to say, okay, we do nothing about that. We don't make it better. We don't give people tools to be able to work through that. We don't say that. We say, hey, well, just because it was, it sucks for some people, <laughs> doesn't mean it's got a, it's okay. It's not okay. Then. Conflict is hard and we don't like to sit with it. But I really believe the power of a really good true story is one that looks at those really dark moments. That's ahead on the agenda. Study after survey after news report all seem to agree. Teenagers want and need better access to mental health services. Demand for treatment for eating disorders, substance use disorders, anxiety and depression all increased over the past few years, even as mental health professionals, schools and governments scrambled to meet teens where they were. The word crisis gets used a lot, so let's find out where this stands and what's needed from Kathy Short. Executive Director of School Mental Health Ontario. She's coming to us from just outside Hamilton. And here in our studio, Quam McKenzie, CEO of the Wellesley Institute and a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. Joe Henderson, Executive Director of Youth Wellness Hubs Ontario and Director of the Margaret and Wallace McCain Centre for Child, Youth and Family Mental Health at CAMH, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. You win. That's the longest title I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Annie Kidder is here, Executive Director of People for Education. No, you win. That's a nice short title. Thank you. And Mahalia Dixon is here. She is a Youth Engagement Specialist, also with CAMH, and it's great to have you four here in our studio. You again. You two for the first time. And Kathy, thanks for joining us from just outside the hammer. I want to start by reading something that was in the Globe and Mail last month, and that will set up the discussion to come. This from feature writer Aaron Anderson. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up the graphic here. Early on in the pandemic, the predictions were grim. Scientific papers warned of a, quote, mental health tsunami. Experts worried about escalating anxiety and depression. But the big picture theme of the pandemic, according to a growing collection of data, is not panic, but resilience. As a new international study led by Canadian researchers and published Wednesday in the British Medical Journal suggests, humanity has, for the most part, quote, made the best of a difficult situation. According to the study, university students and seniors experienced minimal to small increases in depression, that is, enough to cause a blip on a mental health scale, but not enough to dramatically upset a person's day-to-day. There was no evidence of an overall spike in depression and anxiety among teenagers, at least in that first peak pandemic year. Okay, this was a big shocking revelation, I know, to a lot of people. And a couple of weeks ago, Quam, you were on that program, actually, when we talked about this. Uh, we did a program on this Canadian survey in which the notion of a tsunami just was not there. Uh, it did not happen. Uh, as many predicted. And I would kind of like to get everybody's first-hand impressions of how that sounds to them, this study. Kathy, start us off if you would. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate that report and the um, story of resilience that it paints. But it's important to remember that our data story is, is young and still unfolding. And so we do have to hold things lightly. And, and I think what we're learning in population research doesn't always translate to the individual experience. And so, you know, we, we know there are young people out there who are really struggling. And so when they hear a report like that, they, their families, and you think about how mental health reverberates, um, you know, they're feeling some deep pain. And so that, that finding may not sit exactly right. So I think if there's, uh, the way I look at it is there's one thing that um, we've learned in the pandemic is that we really can't be thinking in universals. Um, that while we had some common experiences in the, in the pandemic, it landed differently for different people. Uh, we all experienced some hardship, but for some there was more loss, more grief, more challenges, more strain. So depending on circumstances, I think we have some young people um, who are actually managing okay. Um, we have some that are experiencing what I would say is more distress than disorder, and we have some kids who are really struggling. Okay, so, let me let me jump in line, there, and I'm going to get some uh, sure. reaction here in the studio as well. Annie, to you first. What are you hearing from the school systems? 
a lot of stress. So we survey all the principals in the province. They definitely said, uh, compared to the beginning of the pandemic where COVID was the struggle, that to them the biggest challenge now was kids' mental health and staff mental health. Um, and that they didn't have enough access to resources and that the system itself was strained. It's not, it's an education system, it's not a healthcare system. Um, so they, they were having a hard time accessing mental health specialists. Um, and that there, the, it was adding to a level of stress in the school, but they were, they were the comments in the survey were amazing in terms of the principals saying the increase in behavioral problems, in um, self-regulation, and in kids in real distress was huge. And they were worried that the world thought everything had gone back to normal. And they went, everything mm -hmm. isn't back to normal. And we really want to be able to help these kids, and we don't have enough help to do it. Joe, from your standpoint. <clears throat> Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's interesting the use of language such as resilience is a little bit problematic from my perspective. Okay. You know, in part, we're expecting young people to adapt, and really, we need the systems to adapt. Right. Um, we need the systems to adjust and create sort of less stressful environments, as well as uh, supporting young people to cope more effectively. As long as we have systems in place that are not reflective of the needs of young people, then we're really, we're, we're situating them in contexts that are likely to lead to stress, distress, and, and as Kathy said, um, higher levels of disorder as well. Quam, are we in the midst of a teen mental health crisis in your view? If you look at the Canadian data, or even further, if you look at the uh, Ontario data, it's very different. So in 2019, uh, school surveys, 21% of kids had uh, mental health problems. 2021, 26% had mental health problems. 60% were saying that their mental health had been affected by uh, COVID. And um, also, and very worrying, one in five kids in 2021 said they had deliberately hurt themselves in the last year. How do you define that? Well, it's deliberately hurt. I mean, people scratch themselves, some people are cutting, but they're not, it's not trying to um, uh, necessarily uh, commit uh, suicide. It's sometimes uh, trying to relieve tension hmm. by hurting yourself, by... Uh, scratching yourself by cutting yourself to relieve anxiety and depression. This is worrying. So um, we could talk about whether uh, there's a post-COVID tsunami, the, not that we're post-COVID, mm -hmm. um, or not, but we have significant issues in teen mental health that we haven't dealt with. Yeah. Okay, I've purposely left you to the end because you're the youngest among us and um, you have your contacts on this story in a way that perhaps others don't. So why don't you share what, where you think we're at on this right now? Yeah, I mean, I think as folks have already said, there's a lot to be said when it comes to young folks' mental health. Um, and when thinking about data specifically, like data, of course, not negating how important it is, it is incredibly important, but it's also equally, if not more important to be looking directly at what young folks are saying, right? And what we're hearing is that young folks are saying, I'm struggling, I need support, um, you know, I'm not getting the services that I need or the services that I'm getting, you know, they're not really matching what I'm mm -hmm. experiencing, right? And um, of course we know that the experiences of young folks also change tremendously, right, as they age and especially during the pandemic and so much societal change as well. It's impossible to sort of keep up for young folks in certain ways. And so um, despite the fact that, yeah, like overall, um, some folks are thriving, some folks are doing really well, some folks are also struggling. And it's important that we're looking at things at an individual level, um, not just at like a global level or a larger scale level to get a real picture of what's happening for young folks' mental health. That's a point that's clearly emerging as we mm -hmm. uh, make our way through this whole thing. Joe, I want to follow up with you. How do, how do you tell the difference between what's just typical teenage angst that everybody goes through when they become a teenager or what is something deeper and more profound perhaps related to the pandemic? Well, I guess I would ask a different question. And that is... You didn't like the question I asked? <laughs> <laughs> uh, who deserves support? And from my perspective, it actually doesn't matter how I define, you know, is it this or is it that? Where on the continuum is it? What's critical is how does the young person feel? What are they saying they need? And how are we responding as adults, as systems? Um, I think that's the critical question. 
Once we create opportunities for young people to connect, we get to know them, we can engage with them, then we have an opportunity to understand what's really going on. We can, we can start to differentiate between is this a, 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 a need that's arising in the moment that we can respond to sort of briefly and, and support a young person? A, you know, is it a challenge that just exceeds their coping uh, capabilities and, and a little bit of investment will support them? Or is it something deeper, bigger that's emerging in the context of something that'll last for longer. And we can adjust what kinds of services we offer in response to that. But the first and most important question to ask is, how are you doing? What do you need? I take your point. I'm going to see if I can come up with a supplementary question here that will meet with a little more favor. <laughs> uh, and Quam, I'm going to put it to you, which is, I, I understand that if you're a kid and you're in trouble, it kind of doesn't matter if you're in trouble because of A or B or C. Could be something related to your family, could be something related to the pandemic, whatever. But do you make a distinction, or should we make a distinction between those who are just suffering from what you might call typical teenage angst versus something you picked up in the pandemic? I think we do, we should make a distinction, but that doesn't mean that people don't need support or help. The distinction is about uh, maybe what people need to help them thrive rather than whether they should be getting support. So, yes, I mean, the fact that uh, teenage years can be rough doesn't mean to say, OK, we do nothing about that, we don't make it better, we don't give people tools to be able to work through that. We don't say that. We say, hey, well, just because it was, it sucks for some people <laughs> doesn't mean it's got a, it's OK, it's not OK. And I, I, I really like what Joe was saying. Let's turn it around and say, what a teenagers need to thrive mm -hmm. and what do we need to do to help them thrive mm. and uh, listening to what people think they need uh, help you know sort of uh, trying to work out what we can do both professionally and sometimes not professionally what peers can do to help each other how schools can be set up to help kids thrive uh, how we can give people um, uh, skills to self-regulate. There are loads of things we can do uh, to help people. And um, I, I think, um, personally, I think if I, uh, during my teenage years, had been uh, listened to a bit more <laughs> and given more skills, hmm. uh, then I would have had a better teenage, uh, teenage years and I'd have wasted less time, quite honestly. You still turned out OK, Quinn. <laughs> Yeah, but think of what could have happened. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Kathy, let's go to you. Can you tell, based on what you're hearing back from the schools that you deal with, can you tell if we're in a worse place today as it relates to student mental health than we were pre-pandemic? You know, coming into the pandemic, we were still having child needs mental health problems. I think one of the, the sort of maybe enlightening moments that we've all had is that we're having conversations like this. Um, and so we're putting attention and support and using the investments that have been made wisely and mobilizing quickly. Um, but we do have coaches in every school district and, and they're pretty apprised to what's happening out there. And we are hearing certainly um, more, more acute concerns and more need for, for those sorts of services, but also really some excellent stories of hope and amazing things happening in classrooms every day. And I think we need to shine a light on that as well. I want to take that light and I want to shine it on your report, Annie, because I think one of the things that emerged from your report was the notion that if we're going to improve the mental health of students, we may first have to improve the mental health of teachers. Can you make that link for us? Well, yeah, and I also want to link back to Kwame's point about skills, because I think that there's the kind of short term, uh, you know, is there an emergency and how do we deal with it? And I hope we're not just going, if it's not a tsunami, then who cares? Mm. You know, there's obviously a storm. Um, but, so there's two parts to this then. If we think about the skills and if we think about what we should and could be doing in the education system to recognize uh, these as teachable, learnable skills that start from early childhood and go up all the way through the system and that are not little add-ons, not a little square on the curriculum going, you should look at social emotional learning too, but actually understanding them as serious so that when you hit a crisis as a young person, hopefully, not everybody, uh, you'll have more skills 
skills to be able to deal with it. You'll understand how you're feeling. You'll be able to communicate how you're feeling to other people. You'll know if you need help, which is a really good indicator of whether or not you have those skills that you go, I'm actually in trouble now. I need to go to somebody to ask. So there's a long-term thing here that hopefully we're learning from, uh, which is a significant change needs to be made in schooling so that um, we, we deal with partly an inequity here because some families can go access help, have more wherewithal to kind of have these conversations at home. But And I'm not saying teachers should become mental health experts or deal with uh, mental illness, but it is important that we're thinking about what needs to change in the system. But yes, another part of the report that came out was that there's a lot of stress among all school staff too. They also have gone through a pandemic, but they're, they also felt there wasn't enough staff support so that then you've got kids who are really struggling and less access to staff, then more staff going, this is, I'm really, now I'm in a crisis, I'm gonna take a leave, less access to staff, more kids struggling. So there is a kind of uh, just spiral, one principal called it a downward spiral that takes place. But to me, that skills piece is a key long-term piece here where that shouldn't be something that only, you know, families with the kind of, only certain families have access mm. to. Would you make that connection between improved mental health for students needing to start with improved mental health for teachers? Uh, I would like to see both simultaneously, but mm -hmm. absolutely. We know that the mental health of young people is affected by the mental health of the adults who surround them in their lives. And school, of course, is a, a context within which um, many young people, most young people, are engaged at younger ages. And so ensuring that um, uh, teachers and other school staff have uh, their their own skills around mental health, their mm -hmm. own literacy, and, and the supports in place to support their mental health will be an important piece of, of movement. Moving forward. Can I get you on that, Mahalia? I mean, we, we seem to want teachers to be experts in so many different things these days, uh, beyond just uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, so to speak. Do you think they can be experts in, maybe not experts, but are they, are they, mm -hmm. how big a piece of the mental health solution for, for students are teachers in the first place? I think they could definitely play a significant role, right? But I think there's also a distinction between capacity and expertise. Right. And I think that it's important that we're talking about capacity here, right? Like it's, we definitely don't want to put too much pressure on teachers yeah. and then, that, then they'll just crumble, you know, because they already have so much on their plates. Um, but it means that they have the capacity to identify different things and their students as they see them. They spend the most time with their young people, right? Even more than their parents a lot of times. They should be able to identify it and then link them to other services, whether it be more guidance counselors in schools, counselors in schools, psychologists, and then also linking them to community resources as well. So for me, when I see teachers, it's that um, liaison role, right? That be able to, okay, I see my student is struggling. How can I help you? And maybe I can help you by linking you to this other resource with other folks who are experts, right? And who do have the capacity, the time, the energy, and the resources, really. The resources is the key thing here as well to support these young people in the, in the, um, in their, in their communities, right? So that way they're not going out of their communities, they're not going um, out of um, their comfort, I guess, to access services, and instead they're getting what they need as it's coming to them. Let me pick yeah. up on that. Joe, I guess we'll go back to first principles here. Mm -hmm. Should the school be the hub of a student or a young person's mental health experience? Schools have a really important role to play. Um, and community-based services mm -hmm. are essential. Uh, so our most vulnerable young people, for example, may not be attending school. School may not be a place that feels comfortable for them to attend, uh, and certainly not to receive their mental health services. So we really need options. We need options that, um, that reflect where expertise sits, where young people are and need to be and want to be. Um, and so that's gonna include schools, but it's also gonna include community. Let me get you on that, Quam. Where What should be the hub where students can get those mental health services? Well, I think that we have just gone through a tumultuous time. Everybody knows that um, COVID has been difficult for people's mental health. And it's not clear to me that we have a plan of how to deal with uh, some of the people who've been most affected, who've had their lives significantly interrupted. We don't necessarily have a catch-up plan for their education. And we don't necessarily have a catch-up plan for their social development and their mental health development. And so when I hear these sort of conversations, what are we gonna do about 
staff mental health uh, in schools, teacher capacity, who links to whom, you sort of think, wouldn't it be good to have a plan? <laughs> Right. Who's, who's responsible for coming up with the plan? Well, uh, the, I mean, obviously, uh, you would want both the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health to be working together to try and work out what the plan should be and who does what. Because there are some things about um, promoting wellness and uh, not about mental illness, about promoting mm -hmm. wellness and trying to get people as well as they were before, right? Do you know and, if they're doing that, incidentally? Sorry? Health and education, yeah. do you know no. if they are, in fact, doing that? Yeah. But Kathy can says help no. you. OK. <laughs> but Kathy <laughs> can help okay. you on that. OK. Um, but, but, but I'm just saying, having... If I don't know the plan, and if parents don't know the plan, hmm. then the plan is not being implemented, because everybody should know what the plan is. And it would be great to actually be clear what the plan is, because if we know what the plan is, and if students know what the mm -hmm. plan is, that is part of the issue. Somebody's got you. <laughs> right? okay, Somebody's well, got your back. Let me get that Kathy. changes how you... Sure. Yeah. I'm going to get Kathy and Annie on this, and let me just preface the question by saying, health's an $80 billion a year ministry. Education's a $35 billion mm -hmm. a year ministry. So they got a lot on their plate. And whether the two of them can actually speak to each other is a very open question. Kathy, why don't you come in and tell us whether you think there actually is a coordinated plan between health and education to resolve this? I would say there, there are uh, some really important things happening right now. So there is actually a comprehensive school mental health strategy. And to, to Kwam's part, uh, point, if we aren't communicating that well, um, we need to do that because there are folks who are actually enacting this day by day. And I'd love to give an example of that uh, that I think would be resonating. Um, but to your other point, in terms of collaboration across sectors, that is absolutely happening um, at the sort of intermediary level. So the level of folks like me who are working with folks like Joe, folks like the Knowledge Institute, uh, Children's Mental Health Ontario, we've come together to create a vision and a strategy called Right Time, Right Care. And it is exactly what Kwam is talking about in terms of how we need to work together across our systems where schools are doing really excellent work with wellness promotion and uh, uh, prevention and early intervention and our community partners are, are providing excellent services uh, with intensive care and many elements of that are well underway. So I just I would want your audience to have some confidence that there are some really excellent things already happening um, and our problem is one of communication and scale. So we have to be thinking about scalable uh, sustainable solutions together. Okay, that's good to know, but I heard you say no, Annie. Well, I, and I, I feel bad because School Mental Health Ontario is an incredible organization doing incredible work. So there are things going on, but I think they're often the kind of beautiful exceptions, as we like to call them, so that what what people working in schools, they're, they're not experiencing a plan. And one of our calls in our most recent report, which we have been calling for since the beginning of the pandemic, is a task force. Task force are the answer to everything. But to make sure that we have people at the table with the experience and the expertise from health and education so that we're we're actually understanding as a public, as parents, as staff in schools, as kids, it's like there is, there's Everybody's gotten together. Everybody's talked to each other. They've tried to work out. So they've listened to principals who are going, that's great that there's a plan over here, but I, I can't access community mental health, or I actually don't know enough about it, so I don't know how to do it, or I'm so overwhelmed by all the other things I have to do. I don't have a staff person. I just need a, you know, you could find out, I actually just need a person paid part-time to be the community liaison, liaison who could help me find that. But I, we are, I don't think there's a good enough, strong, enough plan. I think it is really important that we're able to scale really great examples of things that are happening on the ground, but they often rely on heroes or people who really know how to work the system well, and what we need is something more comprehensive than that. And in my experience, which is for over a very long time, ministries aren't that good at talking to each other or kind of sharing turf and understanding how they have to be work, have, how they have to work together. But I do want to say School Mental Health Ontario has been an incredible innovation in this work because there's a lot more there now than there used to be. 
Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd agree. Um, you know, um, Kathy and School Mental Health Ontario are doing great things. Joe's doing great things, and various people are doing great mm -hmm. things. Uh, and I wasn't uh, wanted. They don't want to be misinterpreted to say that there is nothing happening. I was specifically interested in the post-COVID, and I keep on saying post-COVID, mm. though I don't think we're post-COVID. I was trying to think of the catch-up. Yeah. What is the specific plan for the catch-up? That was that that was the question that I had. Catch up referring to? Well, people have gone, people have missed time at school. Uh, there are increased rates of mental health problems. 25% uh, of kids have had a deteriorating relationship with their parents. That does not bode well for their mental health. Mm. Yeah. Some of those teens are going to be moving out of school into university, perhaps. You know, how is that going to work? Yeah. It's all of that sort of, we went through a hard time, people gave up a lot. Who, how are we making that up to get people back to where they were? We said we were going to build back better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have we actually dealt with the issues that have come out of the uh, pandemic so far? And that was the question I had. Yeah. What's that plan? And if I can interrupt, as is my won't, ask my husband. <laughs> um, it's, it's, that, it's exactly that. The principals are going, they're going, things aren't back to normal. Don't just go, yippee, that's done, because things are not back to normal in school. So what is the plan? And it's a kind of, and it's, much, you know, we talk a lot about learning loss, but we're not talking about catch up in a in a more global kind of way and i think that that's why there was a kind of cri de corps from principals going something's going on here and people aren't paying enough attention well jill let me go to you on that yes what does a what does a catch-up plan look like absolutely well i want to uh, sort of jump off of something kwam said which is just the importance of thinking not just about one piece but in fact yeah. thinking about the whole picture and uh, when we talk to youth when we partner with young people and and you know, the kind of work that Mahalia does to support us in doing that, what we hear is young people say, you know, I'm not divided up into health and mental yeah, health yeah, and yeah, substance yeah. use and yeah. education yeah. and family relationships. It's not all separate. It's holistic. It's all me. And our services need to be integrated. I need to be able to walk in the door and say, hey, I need support. And we as a system figure out what are the services we need to offer, how do we engage. I got bad news for you. That's not the way government works. Government works in silos, right? <laughs> there's health, there's education, there's youth services, yes. right? There, so how do you, how do you, I mean, you're basically asking <laughs> silos to talk to each other, which they're Absolutely. not really good at. They're not good at it, and we still have to try. We still have to do it. Something like Youth Wellness Hubs Ontario, School Mental Health Ontario as well. We, we're all about pulling together different pieces of the, um, the lack of system, all of the different services. Uh, you start with people and organizations who have a shared vision around better outcomes for young people, with young people. Uh, you start there and you build. And it can be done. We are doing it. And, you know, it takes, uh, it takes leadership. It takes a commitment to innovation. But we can't be held back by the way things have always yeah. been. If we sit with the way things have always been, we're going to have the same outcomes. Mahalia, mm -hmm. give us your sense in our remaining few moments here about what you think a holistic response to catch up looks like. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, if we're asking young folks to adapt to chaos, then I think that services can also learn to adapt. People with decades of experience can also <laughs> learn to adapt at the same time and can probably do it even better, right, than young people who are, this is your first time going at it. So I think that when we're talking about developing holistic services, it's looking at young people at a specific community-based level, not at like a large uh, population-based level, but specific communities. And going in, seeing what's happening, what do you need? It's about ideally having these hubs that you mentioned earlier everywhere, right? School is a hub. Community is a hub, hospital is a hub, family is a hub, everywhere is a hub that young people can go in and get access to different resources that can then um, launch them, I guess, into you know, a better area of their life, right? Launch them into other services that they need, launch them into university, launch them into career, launch them into whatever it is that they want to be. And so for really when we're talking about uh, holistic services and building holistic services, it's going to individual young people asking, what do you need? And then scaling from there and taking a culturally responsive lens, right? taking um, a community responsive lens, a, geographic, a geographically responsive lens, all of that put into one. Um, and of course, there isn't a one-size-fits-all situation at all. Mm -hmm. Generalization is where we get into 
a lot of trouble. Um, but it's taking care and taking time and being mindful and creating these services by young people uh, and listening to them and their uh, their desires and what they're explaining as they, what they need for services. Kathy, I think I need you to weigh in by telling us mm -hmm. what the consequences are if we don't get this right. We need to get this right. And, and I think we've got a lot of folks working on that. Um, I think Mahalia is speaking a lot of wisdom here, and it, what, what she's saying is very much what we're hearing from young people. They want to be involved. Uh, they want to be part of this solution, and they, they have a role to play in making it better in this support system that uh, has been described. So, Annie, if you're, if you're a teenager in school having issues right now on this, where do you turn? What do your people tell you that you're well, supposed to do? I I think hopefully you can turn to your teacher, the actual, you know, the grown up that you see the most. And hopefully your teacher will have enough knowledge and skill to be able to go, I actually think you need to go over here, talk to the guidance counselor, whatever. There still is that hard problem of, I can see you do have a problem. I'm not sure if you're going to find the, the resource you need. But I think that right now what's important is that we are we have systems, which are hubs, that, that say we, do, we want to hear from you. We want to have this conversation. And there are, after we put out our report, there were two principals who talked, who I think were both in Toronto, who had incredible centers in their schools. They had a wellness center. You could go there. Somebody, you could find somebody else to talk to. So there is attention being paid. I think we are past the kind of hopefully, the kind of stigma as a problem. So stigma is less of a problem, but now it's resources. So people understand that this is not some weird thing that happens to somebody else. I'm not pointing at you. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered what that was. <laughs> <laughs> so it's some weird thing that just happens to call me. Um, but that we all struggle at various times in our life and that it's important that we're paying t attention to this and, and being, you know, articulating this in the system. You know what i got to so, say? You know For a show about a really serious I'm topic, sorry. we've had way too much fun out here today. But anyway, maybe that's good. Um, it is. Uh, I, Mr. Director, I want to be able to thank everybody for coming on our program tonight. And uh, I'd love you to tell me where you want to start. Okay. Bring the boxes up, if you would. There they are, in the top right corner. Kathy Short, School Mental Health Ontario. Thanks for being there for us on the line from the hammer. And in the bottom left-hand corner, Joe Henderson, with a title too long to get into right now. Let's just say Youth, Wental, Youth Wellness Hubs Ontario. Uh, and Mahalia Dixon, Cam H, Youth Engagement Specialist. And then over there on the other side of the table. The weird guy. <laughs> Quam McKenzie, Wellesley Institute, University of Toronto, Annie Kidder, People for Education. Okay, that's it. Get us out of here, everybody. Thank you. The thing about families is that at one point or another, we've all both hated and loved those we're related to. But rarely has it been described as Kelly S. Thompson does in her new memoir, Still... I cannot save you. It's about her relationship with her sister, the expectations we have for our siblings, and how our wrongs don't need to define us. And Kelly S. Thompson joins us now. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. Um, so <laughs> I'm just going to let the audience know that <laughs> I will probably cry at some point. Me too. In this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it was really hard to read this book without tissues, uh, lots of tissues. What was it like for you? to emotionally write it, to relive those experiences? I, I mean, I think sometimes we have this vision of, of authors just sitting and typing away and sobbing, but that really was me. I mean, I, I would close my computer and um, my face was swollen every single day. It, I think my family has been sort of wondering why I would want to linger with it so much. Why do you want to write about this? Because it was horrible the first time. Why do you want to linger with it now? Mm -hmm. um, but I was really determined to find some beauty in it. And I often think about who needs this book, like who's at the other end needing this book. And that motivates me to keep going, even though it's hard, so. But your sister wanted you to tell this story. She and, did. And she said to you when she was in hospice that I want you to tell all of it, even the ugliness. Yes. So what do you think we get? Because I was just saying to you before we started taping that um, sometimes when you read memoirs, it's hard for us to be critical with ourselves, mm -hmm. but you were very hard with yourself. So what do you think we get from writing about the ugliness? 
Well, wh I remember when my sister died, I was really craving a book that would linger in the moments of when the person died or when people behaved poorly, because we have this real tendency to gloss over those moments, because conflict is hard and we don't like to sit with it. But I really believe the power of a really good true story is one that looks at those really dark moments. And the requirement is that I'm gonna do the same to me and treat myself as a character as I would everyone else in the book. Or the reader has no reason to trust you. They don't trust that you're telling a true story if you don't also accept the moments where you were flawed. Because realistically, no one's all hero and no one is all failure either. We have all these spaces in between and that's where I think story lies in the gray. And we go on that journey with you because your perception of your sister changes uh, as you, with different life experiences. We have a picture of the two of you and it is so adorable. Um, can you tell us what your relationship was like with your sister Megan when you were kids? Megan was just everything. Look <laughs> how cute she was. Is she giving you a headlock? <laughs> I like to think she's not. She's also weirdly wearing a negligee, which feels somewhat inappropriate, but she loved to play dress up. <laughs> Megan was the sister that you hungered for. Um, mm -hmm. I was chronically shy, did not make friends well. And when you're in a military family like we grew up in, where everyone's sort of cycling in and out of your life all the time, when you're shy and quiet, it gets pretty lonely. Megan would let me play with her all the time, even though she was three years older than me. She, she didn't pick on me. She didn't make me feel small. She welcomed me at every turn. She was the sister everyone would have wanted. Well, you write, you have a line. I mean, you have a lot of um, uh, writing in this book that just kind of takes your breath away. Thank but you. there's a line that's quite profound. You write. It is such a special sort of pain to love someone you don't like very much. You talk about, you talk a lot about how likable your sister was to other people. Yeah. Why not with you? Megan got addicted to various drugs when she was younger, around teenage time. And she made a lot of really difficult decisions. She was stealing from us. She was stealing from me. She was calling me at all hours. And at this time, I was also an officer in the forces. So she was, at some cases, putting my career in jeopardy. And I was angry. I, but I also didn't understand. I didn't understand addiction and the effort that I made as I got older um, to understand the complex nature of addiction and the behavior that people will enact in order to feed that addiction. So she was really hard to love. She was um, not a great person, but then it was also part of going, well, sometimes neither was I, and she loved me back too. So, but it is really hard to love someone who you have to separate yourself from for your own safety and sanity, which is what I eventually had to do. Well, you reach a crossroads and you make this really, I mean, I'm guessing a very difficult decision. You testify in a trial against your sister. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to do that and what was the impact to you? My family was really brushing a lot of her behavior under the carpet and she'd been stealing from a lot of different people in her work. Um, and it was more so, she had a, a, an agreement with the judge, so I didn't have to go to a trial, but she wanted me to speak in her favor. And my parents kept lying and paying people off and trying to fix it, but it wasn't fixing it. And I knew that if she didn't actually get some help, if she didn't really see how bad it was, it was never going to stop. And I had lost her so long before that I wanted to lose her in a way that honored her in the choices she was making in terms of she had to take control of that decision and I had to step back and accept that I couldn't change it for her. So telling the judge the reality of how many times this had been swept under the rug was the thing that finally got her pushing to get treatment and she acknowledged that to me um, even though I think it was a decision that was really hard for my parents to accept. Well, how old were you both when this happened? I would have been in my early 20s, mm -hmm. and she was in Three her late old. 20s, yeah. yeah. Um, what You mentioned your parents. How did this impact your parents and your relationship? It really divided us because like, my parent, I say my parents really ostriched about it, you know, really stuck their heads in the sand about the reality. 
And it was funny, maybe a couple years ago and uh, before she had died and, and my, my dad said, well, you know, it was really bad, your sister's addiction. I was like, yeah, <laughs> I know. That's what I was saying all this time. Uh, because we had shared friends and I knew how bad it was. And I knew, uh, I heard people talking, whereas my parents weren't part of that world. Mm -hmm. um, and because she was calling me and kind of playing that sister card to have me keep things quiet. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't do it anymore. And I was exhausted, but it definitely pitted me against my parents often because they, they tended to think I thought the worst of her, but of course I didn't. I loved her more than anything. I just wanted her well. Why do they think that though? Um, I wonder if it's potentially sometimes because Megan had cancer when she was younger as a baby and they were very close to losing her. Mm. And I think there's a special sort of tenderness for losing, almost losing a child. Um, whereas I was always a overachiever and um, really studious and really got things done. I was sort of the responsible one. You were um, okay. But to my own detriment sometimes, mm. I think. When you think back during that time, what was it about you to make that decision? Because I just keep thinking you were really young. I remember being in my 20s where it's just about self and you had to make a decision that impacted uh, your relationship with your sister, your relationship with your family. And what if it didn't work out? What if she still went down that road of addiction? I had to know that I did what I thought was best for her. and. I'm, I mean, I'm honest in the book too. I wanted to be right. Like I wanted someone, I wanted to not be the horrible sister. I wanted to be the one who was really cognizant of what was going on and trying to take a stand to change it. I think if I hadn't spoken to the judge, I always would have wondered, even if she continued on that path, at least I held a firm line in terms of, I was going to support groups and I was trying to read all these books and I was going to Al-Anon for families, trying to understand how to support her. And I had to recognize supporting my sister had to be from a distance because it was the only way that was safe mm -hmm. and continuing to enable her was doing nothing. Your relationship with your sister changes for the better yeah. after she had uh, her first child. What yeah. happened? I think Megan finally started to recognize there were people outside of her own sphere because she suddenly had this little one that she wanted to give everything to. Mm -hmm. And I had something out of my own sphere because I was in my 20s and we, I came together and I ended up seeing her but it, and seeing my nephew for the first time and going, oh, this is what it's about. Mm. It's about family. It's about so much more than us. It's about this next generation. It's about legacy. Uh, it's not all about me and what's making me upset today. And sometimes you have to forgive and move on mm. if the person's making the right reparations, I think. Well, your sister becomes pregnant with her second child and then probably the worst news ever. What happens next? It might, yeah, it was a pretty impossible day. My sister had been in hospital for quite some time because she had kidney cancer as a child. She had a lot of scar tissue in her abdomen. So she'd been in hospital and they thought the baby was catching on the scar tissue, but it turned out it was a um, massive cancerous tumor and the baby had been hiding it the whole time. So we found out on, ironically, a day I also found out I couldn't have children. My husband was deployed overseas for a year at the time and she had the baby quite er about seven weeks early, I believe, and then found out about the tumor. How soon did you realize that it could be the end? For immediately your for me. I think I was one of the very few people who immediately recognized. I mean, you only had to Google the type, it was a sarcoma, which is super rare. Um, you only had to Google it to know. And it was a very strange twilight time in the couple months after uh, because the tumor ruptured and she had to have a bunch of massive surgeries. And then it was like we didn't talk about it. We sort of danced in this weird period of pretending things were fine even though they really felt like they were crumbling. But you didn't want to push her because it was kind of like pushing her to face a reality she wasn't ready for. Who wants to face a reality they're leaving behind their two children? and their loved ones. Well, um, you talk about when your sister came with you to pick up your husband at the airport who had been deployed. At one point, you tell each other you love each other and uh, you write this. For years, I denied her those words, 
like I wanted her to earn them as though love was something to earn. And I'd always looked down on her for the way she gave love so freely, always willing to risk getting hurt if it meant a chance at a family. That judgment was so foolish in the light of everything we face now. Hard not to read that without crying. I have tissues. Thank goodness. <laughs> I just Thanks own it. I've been crying all over the city, it feels. Yeah. Um, you know, what did you learn from the way that your sister and the way that she showed her love? She was just, you know, I judged her for such a long time because I felt she was promiscuous and I judged that. Um, I judged that she just wanted to be loved so badly she'd do anything. She would change her personality. She would change who she was. And I would think, these men don't deserve you and how lovely you are. But I was one of those men too in how I treated her in that I made it like she had to earn my love back. Whereas really she just remained being, when she got clean, she went back to being my sister. And she just didn't punish people for their bad behavior. All those years that I said harsh things to her and I was cruel because I was angry, she never held it against me. She just loved freely and that's a beautiful thing in a world that's quite ugly at the moment. And we don't do that enough. And it seemed as if she was hyper aware of the mistakes that she had made. Yes. Because towards the end when she was in hospice, she was in a lot of pain. And at one point she was worried about taking uh, too much. Yes. Because, and then you were joking, like you would do these, you call them death jokes? Yes, our where, death jokes. Where mm -hmm. you would say, oh, are you worried you're gonna overdose? Yeah. But she seemed to, to the very end, she still, uh, she it was very hard on herself on the mistakes that she had made. Did you get that sense from her? Less that she was hard on herself, more that she just really owned it mm. and had made such a turnaround that she didn't want to take steps backwards. So she, um, I think it was something I always really admired about her was I'm really hard on myself when I mess up, which I do often. and she would just sing it from the rooftops. We've kind of giggled that we came from these super quiet parents who were like, we don't share anything. Whereas now my sister and I would, would be like, where did we come from? You know, here we are, we, we overshare everything. And because it builds community when we see shared suffering, I think. And Megan really recognized that. And she wanted um, your whole family to be together, but there was tension with her partner. Yes. I don't need, uh, you don't have to say, you could say, Nam, stop. <laughs> I don't want to talk about this. But after reading the book, I was really worried about your niece and nephew. Um, do you get a chance to see them? Are they still in your life? We see them sometimes. My husband's military, so we live quite far away. Mm -hmm. um, and it's harder to see them. My parents are disabled, so my parents can't look after two young children. Um, Megan's mother-in-law makes a lot of effort. For, for us with the children, and we're lucky in that way. But they are thriving, but they do say things sometimes that are sort of a stab to the heart. Like my, what? My nephew told me once, Auntie, you smell just like my mom. Mm. And how do you, how do you answer that? Um, just try to keep the memory alive while not making them feel like they have to be beholden to her. She loved them, she gave them the gift of that love, and I have to count on that carrying them through. She loved being a mother. Oh, yeah. And she even left them little uh, memories for them to remember her. What yes. did she do? She recorded her voice. Friends coordinated it for us. She recorded her voice, just leaving them little messages, and then we put them in Build-A-Bears. Um, she's written cards to them for up until their 18th birthday, and I have those, so I'm holding on to those. Um, it was kind of sad sometimes at the end these grasps at legacy that she was attempting. Mm -hmm. And she kept saying, it just doesn't feel like enough. And so sometimes I think that's why I wrote the book. I just wanted it to be like a fuller legacy that gave a bigger, beautiful picture of what can come from overcoming. Were you able to forgive her for how she behaved when she was younger? Absolutely. But it was harder to forgive some of the decisions as she was, as she was dying. 
Um, I want to read one more quote uh, from when Megan was staying with you and you were settling in to watch a movie together. You write, she lifted the sheets, let me climb in, and I felt heat radiate from her. It was in moments like this where I obsessed about filling the blank space with all the things we'd missed out on. I wanted to share in everything now, but didn't want to spook her into sensing my rising tide of fear that we were running out of time to share these stories. How did you help each other cope with knowing the end was near? I think I was, she said to me that she often would tell me when she was scared because she didn't want to upset my parents. Because how do you cope with losing a child? I tried to really make that space for her to tell me when she was frightened. To, it was like a weird balance between I don't want to cry too much with her because I want to be strong for her, but I don't want her to think I don't care, so I need to cry a little bit. We laughed a lot. We, we would have a lot of moments of, um, we would do this thing before we would fall asleep because she would get quite anxious. Mm -hmm. And we would share little secrets that we'd always kept from one another. Half of them that she thought she was keeping from me, she hadn't at all kept from me and I already knew about them. But we, we just really clung tight. You know, I remember reading this book about when you're in caregiving and how difficult it can be to just embrace that moment because you do, you get nervous about losing time, but all you can do is be with them, be with them, hold their hand, rub her feet. Paint her nails. Paint her nails. Um, I have a lot of grief over the lack of photos from our adulthood together because we don't have any because we were so apart for such a long time. But I think we really made it up to one another. We just treat it every day like it's still going to be an experience. Just because you're in a hospice doesn't mean you're not still alive and still here. Um, I remember one night she wanted to sneak down the hallway of the hospice to go get a snack. And I was like, we don't have to sneak. We can just walk <laughs> down the hallway. But she wanted to tiptoe, like it could have been drugs, but she wanted to tiptoe past the nurses. and She was on a lot of drugs to manage the pain. Yes, and we were tiptoeing down the hallway and eating ice cream out of tubs together like we were having a slumber party. Mm. Well, you mentioned caregiving. Um, you wrote about the staff at the hospice. With your, uh, who were taking care of your sister and helping you. And you wrote about how intimate those care roles were and how important they came to be for your sister and your family. Yeah. You also write um, caregiving, for the peop caregiving for your sister uh, before she died was a gift. How was it a gift? I'm never going to be a mom. And I often think my sister gave me the gift of being a mother of teaching me what it was to love something so much bigger than myself that I would never stop giving even when it almost cracked me in half. I, I was a mother to her in some way, even though she had a, a great mother. And even um, though you were the little sister? Even though I was the little sister. Um, and she even, she joked about, me, about, about that with me once. And, because um, I was at a point where I was holding bags of her vomit and having to wipe her and bathe her but there was this really beautiful intimacy. What does it say when you've had this, when you have love where you know it's gonna be so horrid when they're gone just because they're not there? That's loving well. And she, that's a gift that helped me to move through the grief. When did you lose Megan? She died on August 17th, 2018, after about six weeks in the hospice. And the nurses actually, I just had a fundraiser there with the book. We sold the book there. Um, but the nurses, I was filming another show to promote my first book. And it was live. It was the social. It was live. And I show up, and all the nurses were in the audience. And you know, there's, that's family that you've made. They've lived this life-altering thing with you. And so it's, an, it's another part of the gift that if it's going to happen, it's going to be horrible anyways. You have to just embrace the little parts of beauty that have come from it. She was so proud of you. She yeah. went to one of your lectures, and she was just <laughs> beaming. Yeah. And throughout the book, um, she was writing about how she wouldn't be around for when your first book came out. Yeah. 
and she also left you notes on her phone to listen to after she passed away. It felt like she was just kind of like, what did that mean for you to be able to hear her voice after she had passed? I had asked her to record something she wanted me to hear in particular. And I was sitting with her, holding her hand, and she just kept telling me over and over that she loved me. And in the audiobook, actually, it's my sister's voice that they've used of her saying that recording when I write about it. Um, and when I'm having a really hard day, I just put it on and I'm reminded she was just my biggest fan. Um, if I would write, I wrote something and it was in McLean's and she went around screaming like, I'm in McLean's and she was so excited. And I, just everything I did, she, she worshiped it. And it was almost embarrassing because I didn't feel I deserved it. But she always reminded me that I did. And coming to see me teach that one day was like this culmination of, in some way it felt like she knew she could go because I was going to be okay. I at least would be okay, and we would work together for us all to be okay. Um, there was a lot of comfort there. Um, I mentioned that she wanted you to write a book about your relationships. Yeah. What do you think she would think of uh, this book? She would love it. She would absolutely love it. She would... Megan was really great because she wouldn't have been upset about the harder moments that I write about. Some of it she got to read, some chapters I had written long before and she was proud of them. I was writing it while she was actively dying. Um, it was like a promise to her and it was a promise I really wanted to keep. I think she liked the idea, she said, oh, I'll live on in your book. That's, I'll live on, so I have that. That's quite the thing. There's a scene in the book when she does pass, and your father, I believe, is on the left side, your mother is on the right, and you're at, the, at her feet. Yes. And the way you come together to let her know that she's not alone, that she's surrounded with the people that she loves, just, you know, um, congratulations. And I think this Thank book you. is going to help a lot of people. Thank you so much. And my love to your family. Thank you. your parents and your husband. Thank you. I'm Steve Paik, and thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Paikin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.